So lately I've been doing a lot of stuff with meshes and bifrost, and I want to share some of the compounds to come out of that. The pack contains quite a lot of compounds, but they're mostly just utilities, um, all in service of these main seven uh, like top level compounds. So first off is the cut mesh node, which cuts a mesh along a plane as defined by position and a normal, which in this case I'm controlling with uh, these two locators here. So I can control the position and then with the other one I control the orientation. By default, triangulation is set to auto. So you can see some cases it's not triangulating, others it is. And so it's just trying to determine if it actually needs to or not. Um, but these can still be explicitly turned on or off. A remainder is whether or not the remainder output should be computed. So I'm using the final output uh, uh, terminal on the node. So it'll just gonna return both halves and it doesn't really look any different. Although you can see now there's a cut in the middle. Um, but these will come out as the separate ports. So if I just add a new terminal here, you can see I get the, the bottom half on the first one and the top half on the second. And so by using this cut mesh node, I was able to create a shatter node, which is basically just a bunch of cuts between pairs of points. So the inputs are the mesh and then the point positions of the center of each chunk. And then just between each pair, um, a cut is made for the mesh. So um, the distribution of those centers is really what controls the look that you get. So you can get all kinds of styles um, of material like glass or wood or concrete, just based on the distribution of points. In this case, I'm just using a standard um, scatter node, so the distribution is pretty even. Um, some of the options are pretty uh, similar to the cut mesh, so a lot of these will be the same. Um, I wouldn't worry about the optimization settings, but maybe if you're doing like 10,000 or 100,000 shards and you have really long compute times, um, turning these on might help. So by default, they're just set to zero, which basically means off, but I can set this to like say 70 to limit this to seven, uh, to only consider 70 other points. So each point considers all the points by default, but I can limit this to say each point only consider the closest 70 points, for example. Um, and the max distance is similar. It just limits the distance that it will actually consider other points at. Um, and then max shards, this isn't something you want to use as like a final output, but this allows you to just look at a certain subset of shards. So let's say I'm generating like 100,000 shards. I could say I only want to look at the first thousand. Um, and this is useful for look dev, but obviously for the final output, you would need to turn this back off to get the full object. Um, and this whole time I've been looking at this in the diagnostic view, but if I look at the final output, it's just the original mesh um, as it was. Now, if I zoom in here, you might notice some like little cracks form in certain places. This is because of non-planar faces. A simple fix is just to triangulate beforehand. Now you should see everything should be perfectly airtight and you'll get no cracks. Next is copy geo to points. And this one's pretty simple. It's basically the same thing as um, setting instance geometry and then baking that geometry, but it uses a different method that can be a lot faster. So I've got a basic particle set up and I'm instancing a cube and you know, um, just as instances, it's super fast, but as soon as I want to bake this down into a mesh, um, it gets real slow real quick. Um, I get down to two or three frames per second pretty quick here. Um, if I use the copy node instead, um, I can go to much higher numbers and maintain real-time performance. Um, and again, this is an actual mesh that can be converted to like my mesh or you know rendered with a third-party renderer or anything like that. Um, so, so this one's great for when you have many, many instances that are kind of lower poly. Um, as the poly count increases, the performance advantage kind of decreases. Uh, you know, if it's a mesh with a few thousand polygons, I'd say you could probably just stick with the big instances. It won't be much of a difference. But in cases like these where you have, you know, you're doing like a particle sim and you have like a simple input object, this node can be like hundreds of times faster than the, than the traditional method. Next is the extrude node. So this um, either uses a collection on the input object or an input array of face indices to determine what should be extruded. So I'll go ahead and just use the input array and get the selection here. And I've got a few options, of course, like the distance of the extrusion or the offset. Um, the maintain angle if is if it should prioritize kind of the distance of the extrusion or if it should try and keep all the faces parallel to the original. Um, and then keep faces together, just like Maya's extrude has, you can um, extrude all the faces individually. Um, now on the output, it will include two collections. So if I switch to diagnostic view, you can see these color coded. Um, so the first collection will be extrude faces, which are the tops here. And then another collection called extrude side faces, which are the sides here. So you can use these to kind of just chain multiple together. And maybe I'll do one more. Um, and then I'll do, I'll go ahead and just do another one after that. And for this one, I'll switch it to the side faces. Um, of course I could, if I wanted to, just inject a new selection in the middle somewhere. So let's say I want to extrude over here. 
I can get these faces and then for this one extrude off of here and then the next extrusion will then be um, these sides instead of the previous ones. The extrusion can also be controlled with geo properties. So for the distance, the property is just extrude distance and for the offset, the it's just extrude offset. And um, these can be any, um, these can target any component. So I've just got a randomized geo property for the extrude distance. And so now you can see each point is kind of being extruded at a different distance. Um, and then the original input um, just works as a multiplier of that property. Uh, but I could switch this to be on a per face basis. So if I change the target to uh, the face component, now it's gonna randomly extrude on a per face basis. I could also select the, uh, or target the face vertex component. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, so then there's a Bifrost implementation of Catmull Clark subdivision. So this should be exactly what you get when you press the three key in Maya to smooth the mesh. Um, the resulting geometry from this node should be pretty much exactly the same. So of course I can control the division levels. Um, the smoothing weight is basically just a blend between the original mesh and the smooth version. Um, always recompute is really important. So when this is on, the entire node is gonna recompute everything every time it changes. But with this off, um, it really improves performance when you have a lot of subdivisions. So for example, if I turn this to like say five divisions, it's gonna take a while to compute this first, um, do this first compute because um, it's just making a lot of polygons. But now I can change things, for example, the smooth weight. You can see it's still, you know, it's plenty fast because it's only updating the point position rather than the entire, you know, interconnect between all of the new subdivisions. The smoothing weight can also take in a per point property. So in this version, I'm computing the curvature of the mesh and then I'm using the places with higher curvature to, I'm just remapping it so it has less smoothing there. So I'm able to preserve details like the spikes on the tail. So if I switch back to the first one, everything's all smoothed out. But in this one, it uh, preserves those. It's similar to creasing, although um, if you were to crease an edge like this, for example, the entire thing would be smooth. Here you can see the original polygons are still visible. So it's not fully like actual creasing. Um, that's something I like to add in the future, but this gets you most of the way there. Lastly, there's merge vertices and reduce mesh. And these go together because uh, reduce mesh is really just an iterative version of merge vertices with a few extra steps. So I've converted the mesh to a volume and then back to a mesh just to kind of get a less nice mesh to work with. Um, I can run this through the merge vertices, although um, this node is a little bit too simple for this task. Um, this is good for more straightforward, uh, like you have two vertices that are almost near on top of each other and you just wanna weld them into one. Stuff like that, this is what this is good for. Um, for actually cleaning up a mesh though, that's what this node is for. So as I mentioned, it has the option for multiple iterations. It's set to three here, so it's gonna take a little bit longer. Um, and then you've also got the radius, just like in the merge vertices, but you also have the start radius scale. So it's going to start at, at a, as a multiple of the end radius and kind of work its way up to it through each iteration. And that just produces a much cleaner result. As you can see here, there's no, uh, none of those weird, weird faces. Um, you can also have the option to smooth the vertices between each iteration and then also triangulate, which wasn't needed in this case since this mesh was already triangulated anyway.